Hello, everybody. Grab your chairs and your tea and your coffee and get yourselves nicely comfortable. And we're going to wait a minute or two because it takes a minute for the live stream to begin. So there's a kind of a bit of blurb really being said for the first couple of minutes while we wait for uh, there's a live stream on Twitter and then there's a, a live stream on YouTube at the same time. So it's all kind of streaming out and across the platforms as we wait for people to come in. So you're very welcome to this fourth, uh, fourth webinar on the WPATH files. I think there might be many more in the future. Um, there's so much to say. People are still coming in. Um, I think I think I'll kick it off now. So we'll kick it off officially now. And you know, if people are coming in later, they're coming in later. So you're all very welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm Stella O'Malley and a psychotherapist. I'm part of the kind of team that helped on some level to launch the WPATH files. And with me, I have Carrie Mendoza. Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I think, yes. Hello, I'm, I'm <laughs> Carrie Mendoza. I'm a physician in the United States and I'm, I'm now the director of uh, GenSpect in the US. And I'm an emergency medicine physician who has been working on this issue to help stop the medicalization of gender identity. And yeah, the lovely Mia, writer of the WPATH Files report, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Mia Hughes. As Stella said, I'm the author of the WPATH Files report. And I actually now, I, I have a new title. I am the director of gender for Michael Schellenberger's nonprofit environmental progress. Well done. Very good. And Eliza, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm a graduate student researcher and writer about all things gender. Yeah, I some extraordinary writing. And John Kay. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I am a journalist based in Toronto. I do most of my journalism for Quillette, which is uh, based in Australia. My boss is Claire Lehman. Um, and we, we often publish about, uh, gender with, we have some specialist writers like Bernard Lane, um, Holly Lawford Smith, who is, oh, wow. uh, she's one of our writers. Um, and I sometimes write about it, uh, as does Claire. Um, yeah, and I have a podcast under Quillette and most of the people on my screen, I feel like they've either interviewed me or I've interviewed them in the past and me, I... I think I saw you in the like the glamorous environs of suburban Toronto a couple of months ago. So nice to see, nice to see everybody. Yeah. So tonight's uh, webinar is uh, focusing on the writers, really, and the writer's view and how how the WPATH files have kind of the aftermath, as John was saying just a few minutes ago, how the you know, we're three weeks in now and how they are impacting. But we might start with Eliza because you've followed WPATH for some time. So do you want to talk about you you and your life with the uh, WPATH. Sure. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, good. So my two major research, research interests in the area of gender have been delving into the psychology of two distinct groups or two almost distinct groups, I guess. There is a little bit of overlap. Um, and the one is really trying to understand what's going on with um, trans-identified girls and young women, and the other is my attempt to get inside the heads of um, gender clinicians. And so in pursuit of that effort, I became a student member of WPATH in 2021. And um, I started going to, um, you know, WPATH, EPATH, USPATH conferences, just to try to better understand what was going on inside. Um, and I'm really, I've been really curious about this process of socialization that I see gender clinicians undergoing. And there's definitely evidence of this in the WPATH files. Um, and, and that was something that as a student member, I had had access to these private forums and it definitely did inform some of my understanding of, of what's going on in this kind of enculturation process that clinicians undergo. And so in my reporting on this, I've gotten two main responses. And one is these people are evil and the other is these people are stupid. And I, I feel like the answer is, you know, I mean, of course there are a few bad apples out there. I think we could name a few. 
if we wanted to spoil the podcast early. Um, I know that there are more than a few total nincompoops out there, but I think the interesting story of gender medicine and why it's such a fascinating case story in human psychology is we really need to understand how it is that people who I think for the most part had good intentions and wanted to help these patients ended up harming them. So that, that would be something I'd be very interested to to talk about with y'all tonight. Uh, just before we move on to John, um, you think they had good intentions, a lot of the clinicians, the majority of the clinicians. And I want to remind all the participants, you're very welcome to put in Q&A. We do give a good a lot of time to the Q&A. But you actually think the majority or many have good intentions. And I what do. Le- yeah. Yeah, I do. And I, do yeah. I think in some cases, good intentions can be more dangerous when they're ill-informed because like, I do think that people who believe that they're doing the right thing and who would be horrified if they learned that they were causing harm are going to resist very hard the the evidence that's coming out about the harms of gender affirming care. Yeah. And I often think, you know, when people attack me, which they have, um, the trans activists, I often think, well, they have the courage of their convictions. They, they truly believe in what they're doing. And there's something about when somebody actually genuinely cares about what they're doing. I, I can almost get that. Even if I disagree with them, they do have the courage of their their convictions. Yeah, um, and I think you, we'll just yeah. never reach them if we don't recognize good intentions that have really gone astray. Yeah. 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 And um, John, you're, you're particularly exercised, I believe, about you're on mute on, on about Canada and the landscape there has has I remember WPATH had a conference there in am I right twenty twenty two Montreal yeah my hometown yeah yeah that's it felt like a big year because that was the year the uh the the standards of care came out yes uh the num- number eight or seven yeah. or... number eight, eight. the yeah. biggie has it is it eight already wow it's like uh it's like dog years um. Yeah, no, I'm, um, and as as I was saying before, um, we we started talking in a more formal way. I'm really I'm not used to people being interested in Canada. Um, you know, the only time I ever get asked by like big U.S. media outlets to comment on it's like if there's like a terrorist attack here or an election. However, on this one issue, um, which I call gender wang, um, it's that term does not appear in the standards of care, I should say. Um, or the it, WPATH files. No, it's a, it's a, it's a term I, I like using. I, I use it as a shorthand for sort of a radicalized cultish approach to the issue of gender. Um, although I'm always careful to say like, you know, I'm personally, I know people who, who experience gender dysphoria um, and I'm, I'm always sympathetic with them. I think they deserve dignity and respect. So when I use that term, I'm using it to allude to the almost comically agitated activist cadres who take what I do think actually was originally a well-intentioned idea to an extreme. Um, and, you know, when I say well-intentioned, I, I say that somewhat selfishly because I would say in my own case, until the late 2010s, I would say I had conventionally progressive um, ideas about gender. I have a specific memory of listening to Fox News because uh, my my father in law and mother in law would sometimes like rage watch Fox. They're very liberal, and you know they sort of turn it on to entertain themselves at how stupid they thought it was. And uh, I think I forget which conservative commentator was going on. Uh, this was a, I think this is like North Carolina or something. They were going to cancel some convention because the Republican governor there wanted to keep biological men out of female bathrooms. And I specifically have a memory of watching that and being on the side of like doctrinaire progressives. This is before the issue became as big as it is now and thinking like, you know, what's the matter if somebody is trans identified, you know, why have a panic attack because that person wants to eat in the female bathroom. And, and I say that because, you know, to the extent anyone listening to this thinks of me as, as having generally good intentions, or bad intentions, whatever those intentions are, like six, as recently as six years ago, or f- even five years ago, 
uh, on, on this issue, I had a conventionally progressive approach. And, and the reason, and I think this to some extent goes along with my Canadian identity, is um, in a vague kind of way, I saw it as similar to gay marriage. And, um, and I think there's a lot of people who come to it in that way. And because I'm, I've been a writer for 25 years, all of my writings are on the record. And so, you know, if you go back far enough, like Canada has had gay marriage since I think, I don't know, 2005 or something. Uh, but if you go back far enough, you can find columns I've written, or at least newspaper editorials, where I was, I wouldn't say I was like super opposed to gay marriage, but I remember, uh, well, I had this position that everybody hated. Um, I said marriage should involve at least one woman, um, because I, I, I see women as having a civilizing influence on, on men. And so I said like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with lesbians getting married. But like, I'm not cool with gay men game. And like, so everyone hated my position because it was like conservatives hated me because I thought lesbians should be allowed to get married and progressives hated me because I was same sex homophobic. Uh, but but then in print, I remember I wrote a column saying, you know what, I, I've come around to gay marriage. Um, I mentioned a book by Jonathan Rauch that was called The Conservative Case for Gay Marriage that I found persuasive. Uh, I think like Brokeback Mountain influenced me. It's weird that a film should influence your political views, but it did. And so I think there's a lot of people like me, centrists, and even some Canadian conservatives in Canada who just have this very recent historical memory of being on the wrong side of gay marriage, or at least not being enthusiastically on the right side of gay marriage from the right, you know, from early days. I know that I, I guess it's kind of presumptuous me to assume that everybody on this call is on board with gay marriage because you know there are people who are against gay marriage. I happen to be for gay marriage. If you're, you know, I think the only people in Canada who are against gay marriage tend to be fairly religious and they're not monsters, but they're in a, a minority. And so I think I'm like a lot of people, it's like, okay, next time around, I'm gonna get this right. Like I'm not gonna sort of dither about being on the, the right side of history. And so when I was like, you know, you had more and more trans-identified individuals want to use opposing sex bathrooms and stuff. I was like, aha, now's my chance. Uh, I support that. <laughs> like, let, let, let it be known to history that John Kay was on the right side of this issue uh, until I wasn't. And, um, and I think and, and, and Canada, there's a lot of people in Canada, I think, not only who have that same history of how they came to the issue. But Canada, unusually, and I think maybe Mia would agree with this, is we have an intellectual class and a political class which is obsessed with defining itself in relation to the United States. So like, you know, the United States has private medicine and we have socialized medicine. And the United mm -hmm. States is, you know, foreign policy, unilateralism, and we have multilateralism. The United States is mean and we're nice and um, we have a welfare state, a thick social safety net, and we're socially liberal, and we're not fire-breathing evangelical Christians. So, like, a, like for instance, you know, abortion. Even though abortion is completely legal in Canada, the abortionist who still gets trotted out at election time as like a boogeyman issue, like don't vote conservative because you know Canadian conservatives spend all their time watching Fox News, and they probably they're gonna as soon as they're elected, they're gonna and access to abortion for women, which is like complete nonsense. Um, but this kind of thing has, and, I, and in this sense, Canada is unique. Like we're not like the UK, we're not like Australia, we're not like the United States itself, which has like a vibrant, well, that's the wrong word, but like has a an active culture war between real conservatives and real progressives. Canada doesn't really have, we don't have much of a, a hardcore social conservative constituency here. What we do have is this like pathological need within our intellectual class to distinguish ourselves from what we cartoonishly imagine as like American conservative thought. Well, sometimes it's not so cartoonish. And so the trans issue has become wrapped up in that. It's like to, and, and we would just perverse because despite the fact that like the most influential voices in the movement, the, what's come to be known as in some circles as gender, gender critical movement, are like feminists and lesbians and people like Julie Bindle and people who are on this call who are not fire-breathing conservatives, there's still this like stereotype in the Canadian media that if you're not all on board for affirmation, 
Uh, it means you know you're getting your information from Tucker Carlson, um, and you're, you're probably like a religious Christian conservative. Uh, that's that's unfortunately the parochial, unhelpful ideological environment in which this issue is discussed in Canada. Except I mean, yeah. it's so it's so true about the cartoonish villains that are kind of portrayed on the conservative side. And I have to say, somebody who's utterly politically homeless at this stage. And I just think left and right wing are just anachronistic at this stage. But I, I have to laugh at the, the pompous self-righteousness of the left who always presume that they're just good and right. right. And the, the concerns, it's actually funny to watch it. On Canada, to... it's, yeah, in Canada, it's like, I mean, it's it, it's hard to satirize it because, yeah. you know, it's like when people put five fingers to their chest and say, you know, it's like, oh, it hurts me so much to, when people don't affirm trans children. And they kind of like, it's like they're giving themselves CPR. Like they just, they're, they're, <laughs> we actually like have people like that in Canadian politics and media who, who do that in a non-ironic way. It's yeah. like Reverend Lovejoy's wife from The Simpsons, if you're old enough to understand that reference, except like the progressive version of it. Um, and it's, and, and by the way, this is why, I don't know, I don't presume any if anybody follows me on social media, I know me, I, you and I have exchanged messages on social media. So I think uh, you're on Twitter sometimes. Like the only way to deal with it in Canada is through satire because it's so over the top and ridiculous and like the jargon and the self righteousness that um, like my my preferred posture on Twitter on this issue tends to be satire. Because I don't know any other way to process some of the like the really sanctimonious um, dogma that you see, and not just from politicians and activists. You see it from fellow journalists, people who are you know see themselves as hard-headed skeptics about every other issue under the sun. But on this one, it's like nope, they're they're a church. So extraordinary. Before we go on to, I want to ask you, Eliza, a, a bit about what how you think it might be going down in the WPATH files, because I know you have a lot of ins inside information. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you before that, I'd like to ask Mia, what's your view of Canada? Because, you know, you're also in Canada. So John, of course, absolutely nailed it there with the it is, I feel a large, large part of our problem here is the the desperate desire not to be American, just to be different from the Americans. They really, you feel it. And you certainly, because we're now in a very hysterical stage where trans activists are just losing their minds all the time. And it's, that they, they throw out the accusation, far right American transphobia. It's just every single article or all the Twitter threads, that's basically all they've got at this point. As if none of us in Canada could possibly have reached the conclusion that removing the healthy breasts of a 16 year old girl is bad. We could only possibly have come to that conclusion because yeah, we were watching Tucker Carlson or this 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 far right transphobic hate that is just spreading across the the Canadian border. So and there's also the I find Canadians are always they don't want to rock the boat, right? They want to be they want to be good people, they want to be nice people. And I the way I see it, like the Million March was a really interesting, I don't know if you saw the Million March, which was in September. I stood on mm -hmm. Parliament Hill with thousands and thousands of people. Just explain to people who don't know. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting thing to bring it up. Just what is the Million March and what happened? Right. It was really amazing. Like, because for years I've protested with Billboard Chris. Well, not protested, but I've stood on the streets with Billboard Chris having conversations. Basically, just the two of us stood on Parliament Hill alone. Um, every now and again, someone else will come and join us. But this was September of last year. I stood on Parliament Hill with thousands and thousands of people. So it was, I believe that it was a, the Muslim community who organized. It was one day we wanted to get a million people marching to get rid of gender, gender wang, as John would say, from schools, get gender nonsense out of schools. 
And it was just the, the, the messaging was quite targeted. It was leave the kids alone. And um, I can't remember, there was another chant. It, it was a really inspiring experience. T tons of people took to the streets. But what I noticed was after the fact, it was very, it was a great thing to be a part of. But then after the fact, those on the left seemed, they just dug in. They just, you know, it's not that this, this helped bridge the gap. It's not that they listened and they thought maybe they do have a point. Maybe we shouldn't be teaching kids this stuff. No, they just dug in and they became more extreme. And they, again, it was, it was just, it was painted as far right religious hate and the divide grew larger rather than smaller. And it was quite demoralizing after the fact. I had personal issues with friends that, that came up because of the million march that I wasn't expecting. And I don't know, we've got just so far to go. I can't even, I don't know how Canada digs its way out of this this terrible, terrible place because the the divide is enormous at this point yeah and it's yeah it feels like it's a very long way from coming out of it canada's um eliza the wpath files so what is your feeling in the aftermath what's your feeling about where they're at now because you've got a good kind of you've got a good sense of them you've been following them i remember when you were in killarney as you said, you were walking, walking up the road, <laughs> up and back to go to both conferences. We were in one conference center. And they were in the other. Where would you say they're at now? How would you say it's all impacted them? I know it's speculation, but you do have a good sense of them. I mean, I would say some causes benefit from being understood and some causes don't. And I think that WPATH recognizes this. Um, that's why they didn't want journalists at any of their conferences. Um, they weren't thrilled that Mia and I were in, you know, <laughs> at Montreal. Um, it's why at US Path last fall, there were many sessions about public relations and how clinicians needed to avoid giving too much information about the care that they provide. Um, and it's uh, it's in, you know, WPATH's own statement from a week or two ago where Marcy Bowers talks about, you know, the earth is not flat and gender like genitalia is represented by diversity, which is really a, <laughs> an extraordinary uh, statement. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. I think sunlight is good. I just I no longer predict the straw, like make predictions about the straw that's going to oh, break God, the camel's sorry. back here. Yeah. And um, when you were in, Mon no, not Montreal, when you were watching them in U.S. Path and they were saying about the PR, that's a new thing. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. and that that sounds like a new side of WPATH. Yeah, there were actually three different sessions devoted to public relations during, I think, a three day conference. Ooh. And and the focus was really um, they were even casting doubt on the use of gender affirming care as the term because they say they had message tested it. And that when people hear gender affirming care, they think kids in the driver's seat and that that's a bad thing even though U.S. Paths was the guy was quick to clarify that he thinks, you know, we might think that's a really good thing. Um, and what their wow. PR advice really, like, really boiled down to was to not be specific about care, not be, sp not be specific about procedures, not be specific about ages, call it medically necessary care, and to avoid at all costs scaring the dinosaurs. That was a quote. Fascinating. Do you want to come in, Car Mia? Wait, wait, you've muted. You're muted. I thought I'd unmuted there. Really, they actually said avoid scaring the dinosaurs. That says we're the they dinosaurs. They said don't, don't scare the dinosaurs. Wow. That's a quote. <laughs> That's like the Denton's document. Remember the Denton's document? Yes. Years ago? Yeah. It, had, it had similar propaganda tips. It did. I mean, the Denton's document was just don't don't let the dinosaurs know anything about it. And this is like the dinosaurs are, you know, getting a clue, but don't scare them. So the strategy has evolved. But yeah, it has it has some depth and vibes. Wow, that is so interesting about imagine if they change the phrase gender affirming care, because I have to say, I think their branding is phenomenal and always has been. And their ability to be one step ahead of us who are busy kind of in the weeds with all the details and pulling out 7% and 3% and talking about the different things. And they're off 
branding and marketing. They're not interested in any of the serious academics. And mm-hmm. as we know, look at Apple, like it, it, branding matters. <laughs> and so um, the idea that they would change gender affirming care is frightening and actually very, very believable. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to remember. I was reading exactly this. It was. It was certainly WPATH members. I can't remember. Um, and it was. It was also about the rebrand of gender affirming care. Mm-hmm. And I think they maybe were throwing out the idea of client identity affirming care or client. I, I can't remember. They are. They're trying to come up A with something. Clunky. I don't know if it's going to take off. No. Or really do anything to disguise the crime. Uh huh. I don't know about that. What did you want to say, Carrie? Well, I think that's why the the files are are so important. I, I agree with Eliza. It's hard to say what the actual you know is there one straw because as I've spoken about with the opioid crisis, there wasn't just one thing that sort of the, oh, the yeah. curve started going down. It wasn't just one thing. But I do think this is significant because it does give that granularity and detail that they've been trying to avoid. And as a practicing physician, which I guess, are they calling me a dinosaur? I mean, I, I think it's like safety, safety phobic. You know, when you look at all of this and read it <laughs> as a physician, you it's just outside the bounds of normal practice of medicine. You know, you don't just do on uncontrolled experiments. You don't, you know, pretend that people can consent when they can't. Um, I talked about before the rebranding concept in, in emergency medicine, at least in the States, there's a thing where we, we, we kind of chuckle because all the nursing homes around us are all the same, but about every three years they change their names, but they're the same, but they, they change their names, you know, because they're quote unquote rebranding and they're all mm-hmm. euphemistic. There's one now that's <laughs> that's called like, you know, elevate or, you know, so, so this idea of kind of putting a veneer over low quality care is that there's an element that that goes on, you know, in healthcare. So I, I think, you know, what Eliza was saying is that's the kind of thing you have to, you know, anticipate that um, they would be talking about. Wow. So, Yeah. It's nice to be aware of it and ready for it. I'm always uneasy about gender dysphoria for the same reason, because I tend to call it gender related distress because I'm like, mm-hmm. they're going to change that word gender dysphoria. And every time we say gender dysphoria, they'll be saying that's an outdated word and it'll just. So that's why I tend to anticipate it. But that's a new one for me. Um, uh, uh, Eliza, what do you think? might happen in the future have you any kind of i know you said you don't do predictions but have you any feeling that let's say the marcy bowers and last week there was a bit of a kerfuffle and the leadership Mm. and i know i'm acting as if you're the mole (laughs) on the ground but i wonder have you any sense of it no no i really you mean what's going on inside yeah they're very good at keeping their secrets i must say yeah, I, I'm not the person to give a read on that one. Yeah. Well, who who leaked? Re- who said recently that internally they're in chaos? Was it Jesse Single had a contact or Ben Ryan or someone? We got we were told that they are they're all they for for a number of years they've been in something like crisis mode, but now they're in total chaos on the inside. That was, but I don't know how reliable that is. We haven't had that well, confirmed, well, but surely that's true. I would believe it is because look at the outside, they're in chaos and the inside they are. But I remember in 2018 when I did that film and the entire catchphrase all that year was the phrase, the Tavistock is in disarray. And if I heard that once, I heard it a hundred times. The Tavistock is in disarray. Mm -hmm. The Tavistock is in disarray. And I was like, you carry going, is it? Because there was no signs at the time that it was. And then in 2019, 35 clinicians left Um. Marcus Evans, the governor left, David Bell, the governor left. So it was in disarray. It was, you know what I mean? So it's kind of interesting because it kind of reminds me of that. And that was the phrase they kept on using. I wonder, um, uh, John, if 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 you think that the um, Australia is kind of similar to Canada, you, you, you know what I mean? These kind of Ireland is kind of the same. 
so busy trying to be progressive because they've been forgotten on every other level that they need to kind of make their name and they're the nice guys or something, some sort of, I don't know, national identity crisis. So that's interesting you say that because I work, as I mentioned, I work for an Australian outlet and I think that Claire Lehman, who's my boss and was born and raised in Australia, um, travels widely, but is, is very much an Australian. Um, she kind of finds it strange how parochial Canada is in regard to like how we define ourselves by negative inference in comparison to the United States and how completely absorbed Canadians are in the American culture war, even as our intelligentsia like insists that it's important to maintain our distinct Canadian identity. But they're the ones who were more obsessed than anybody else in what's on American Twitter. So I think Australia is, is very similar in the substance of its social progressivism, if that's the right term. Um, hmm. come, but I'd say comes to it in a healthier way, which is to say it, you know, it's it's becoming naturally progressive country. Uh, I happen to disagree with the, the ultra progressive excuse me, the ultra progressive take on um on the gender stuff. But at least Australians, I would say more than Canadians, are like kind of maybe decide issues uh, on, on their merits. But I'm less pessimistic than Mia about the possibility for change. Um, because I think Mia is absolutely correct that like Canadians are, are herd creatures. Like there's this desire, and you see it in the media, like the Canadian media imagines itself to be, you know, fearless and heterodox and leave no stone unturned, or like these hard ass skeptics who don't trust anybody and stuff like that. But that conceit is completely contradicted by their very Canadian tendency to be like, well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? Well, I ask you first, what do you think? And so like at the end of the day, they're trying to crowdsource a consensus that they're all super stunning and brave about once they've figured out what the consensus is, right? They want the consensus to be stunning and brave, but like once they figure it out, they don't want anybody to depart from it, including them. And so on one hand, that's like very parochial and frustrating and often just manifests itself in really ignorant opinions that they kind of like say, well, okay, this is what we're going to go with. You know, five years ago, we're going to go with the, the gender affirming dogma. And even as evidence is built up in the opposite direction, they're sort of sticking with it. However, it does give an avenue for change because once the tipping point comes and it just becomes, and you're starting to see it a little bit, where it just can't be sustained anymore. When change comes, it'll come very quickly because if word gets around, there's a new consensus and the consensus is, hey, maybe like cutting off a kid's junk isn't like a super progressive way to deal with homosexuality. Then people, I, I think it, it's going to be shocking how quickly you're going to, and you saw that, you see this a little bit in the UK, like, you know, people kind of mm -hmm. scrubbing their social media of born in the wrong body, sloganeering, and like, um, what was that? What's that British NGO that gives out like little scout ribbons to everybody if, if they tweet a Stonewall? Stonewall, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, they this program, like, if, if you tweet um, gender wing stuff, like, you get like this sort of badge and, uh, prospective employees know that you're super gender wavy. And I think that uh, in Canada, we, we don't need a stone wall because like we just give ourselves scale badges. Like we just, we're, we're all little snitches. Um, but once the tide decisively, and I think it's kind of has started, then that same herd mentality is going to mean that it switches all at once. And I, I don't mean that to say like that the CBC, which is our version, our like really fourth rate version of the BBC, is all of a sudden gonna, you know, Helen Joyce is gonna become a presenter or something like that. But they're just kind of gonna shut up about it entirely. And they all like, mm -hmm. they kind of have a little bit because um, I don't think people realize how important it was when Elon Musk, who's, who's nutty about many different things, but on this issue, you got right. When Elon Musk took over Twitter and suddenly you could say that yeah. boys are boys and girls are girls, 
and you weren't going to get thrown off Twitter for saying so, that was like a huge thing. Because Twitter, perhaps more than in other places, was like the official in-house consensus building medium of the Canadian media. And once that little clubhouse, you could you could say that two plus two equals four, wow. and they took away, you know, the little blue tick marks of everybody who has spent the last five years saying that two plus two equals five. Yeah. That had a huge effect on debate um, because suddenly, you know, it, it, the argument used to be, well, of course, two plus two equals five, because like all all my friends with blue ticks say so. So, of course, it's the truth. And um, and that was like a, a, a huge deal, which is one like Canadian intelligentsia freaked out uh, when the blue ticks got taken away, because in many cases you had people who had no real claim to fame except having blue tick. It was like some regional CBC weekly news host from Saskatoon who had 3,000 followers uh, and tweeted regularly about their non-binary niece. And like their, their greatest pride in life was having a blue tick. And they took that away and people didn't know what to do. It was like, you know, what point is there in existence? Really? <laughs> uh, What's it all and, for? Yeah, no, I mean, it was really... And you had people, it was, it was strange. You, there was one guy in BC who like kept posting screenshots of the blue tick he used to have. Um, he was like the social justice guy. It was like, yeah, still remembering my blue tick, man. It's like, he, and it wasn't a joke. It was like this guy, it was like some grandfather who died and he was, you know, on, on the guy's birthday, he would raise a glass of whiskey to his memory, except <laughs> it wasn't a human being. It was this set of pixels that were like, gave him a sense of self-esteem and like, and, and there was this common sense that, well, now, you know, all the, uh, the ignoramuses will take over because we don't have this blue tick system. And to, to be fair, to a certain extent, yeah, you did see more chaos on Twitter as a result. Yeah. But on the gender wing file, it's been nothing but positive to be able to say that, like, you know, mammals are sexually dimorphic. It's a thing. Deal with it and, and not get thrown off Twitter as a result. And Megan Murphy came back, which is great. Yeah, it was lovely watching people come back, Graham Lennon and all sorts of people came back. It was kind of, it was an extraordinary moment. Somebody should document it. And it was like one of those soap operas where yeah. like there's a funeral and the guy walks into the scene. It's like, oh, we thought you were dead. Um, and uh, you know, I was, <laughs> I was actually out for dinner the night Graham got his Twitter account back. We were out for dinner, me and Graham and a few others. And um, then somebody texted him and said, you're you're back on Twitter. I don't know how it happened. But anyway, suddenly he was there checking to see if he got his Twitter. Right. It, was very, it was a very big deal. It was really. Where big. were you when history was made? <laughs> it was lovely. Harry, what were you going to say? I wanted to ask you just before you tell me what you're going to say. But I wanted to ask you, would you work in the hospital, in the ER? Do they use the phrase gender affirming fair care? Is it in the lexicon in the EOR? No, but but I think as people have know, and I've said before, I'm not in an academic environment. I'm in a community community hospital environment, and so no, it's uh, it it it's not um, okay. commonly you know talked about in in that in that way. Um, when there's occasionally a patient, you know, it's just saying someone's trans identified. Um, but what I was going to say, just based on piggyback on the sort of censorious environment and how it changed on, on X. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of curious with the, with just from the writers, you know, Eliza and John, how just, you know, write how they feel, maybe just writing about this in general, just, you know, off X, but elsewhere in all their um, platforms has, has changed. But I just want to make a quick comment that the files, the WFF files, again, show how um, entrenched this is an actual medical practice. So I think obviously not having censorship is super important for the conversation, getting the information out there. But there is also this whole level of actual medical practice going on that there's actual patients that are receiving um, hormones and surgeries. And so there's this whole nother level that's still 
needs to to be exposed around you know adverse effects and the whole practice of medicine and how all of this still is ingrained and and so um you know it's just super serious obviously but i'm i'm just curious how how you know john and eliza feel that just writing writing all writing about this and the mainstream you know quote unquote mainstream media and you know there's been sort of this hope that there would be just wider coverage in the mainstream media maybe, but it still seems like they've got their blinders on about this. So just kind of wondering about that. Uh, I could I comment. Mia, do you want to want to comment on that? So we got, there was coverage. Obviously we got the least coverage where we needed the most coverage um in the mainstream media so canada we got the least mainstream coverage i would say and i think perhaps canada is the country where we needed the most because we do as far as i can tell we we actually really do follow wpath in every mm -hmm. province maybe alberta is now starting to see sense but as far as i can tell even alberta they're following wpath uh, provincial health insurance plans look to WPATH for what is medically necessary, life-saving care, supposedly. And yeah, the, the U.S. didn't get a lot of mainstream coverage either. And again, the U.S. is where we needed it. And the U.K., they don't follow WPATH. Of course, that's the problem, I guess, that the U.K. is just so far ahead precisely because the mainstream media has picked up this and has been reporting on it for so long. So they're not following WPATH and they understand far more what's going on. I don't, I, like I heard little murmurs that perhaps CBC journalists were going to be contacting me and thankfully didn't hold my breath because nobody contacted me. Um, I still kind of have hope Quebec has now given me hope, Radio Canada with their amazing yeah. piece of investigative awesome. journalism it was so amazing i just can't believe that it came out of the french cbc uh so quebec is giving me hope i think like i i just can't i can't possibly imagine a canada in which the cbc reports on this outside mm -hmm. of quebec i just can't um, yeah you go ahead john so what, what's interesting for me is sometimes like i follow the British media, and uh, this goes to, I think it was Mia who was saying that uh, British media is far ahead on this. Like, in, 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 it's not unusual to see like the Guardian or the Independent or the Times of London or the Telegraph report in like a straightforward, factual way about the Tavistock scandal. Um, like, you know, super respected mainstream papers. And, you know, everyone gets on, on the case of the New York Times. I mean, to the credit of the New York Times, the New York Times has run several deep dives um, into this issue. Uh, and, and you know that they're good articles because all the right people are like, oh, no, the New York Times is genociding trans people by publishing these things. So it you can tell that, oh, that means the New York Times published something factual. Uh, and Canada is absolutely not like that, where... The National Post, which is uh, a mainstream, slightly well, what passes for conservative in Canada, broadsheet newspaper, it does publish factual stuff on this. Uh, I would say the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star, Globe and Mail is probably center, Toronto Star is certainly left wing. The two other main broadsheet newspapers uh, absolutely do not publish uh, much factual stuff on this. Um, and the CBC is, I think they're preparing their hundredth profile of Ellen Page as we speak. Um, it's like, I think they have a whole department devoted to um, celebrating uh, the, the philosophy of Ellen Page. Uh, it like, I, I, it's, it surprises me that you, there were even rumors uh, that Mia heard of CBC covering this. Uh, CBC is actually like absolute propaganda factory in terms of this stuff. And I think the CBC will actually be closed down before anybody in that place actually um, agrees that sexual dimorphism is a thing. I mean, it's just, they think they're, we're all clownfish. Um, it's, it's, it's completely embarrassing. Uh, how that said, I think it's notable, like the CDC has stopped tweeting out stuff 
like largely because they know they're just going to get ratio. So there's this really weird media environment in Canada where this like there's this very brittle kind of echelon of I mean, they're the dinosaurs, actually. We're talking about like broadsheet newspapers and the CBC, which no one's been able to figure out whether the CBC even exists for the last 20 years. They're the dinosaurs, and they're the ones who are still pre pretending that it's like 2019 and men are women and uh, women are goldfish and all this stuff. And it's kind of more like on social media and Substack and podcasts. Um, and you know, and also like newspaper, you know, Toronto Sun, which is, I guess, maybe our version of the Daily Mail, uh, they're kind of like moving ahead with a more realistic coverage of this issue. But there's this very artificial, and also in politics, like even conservative politicians don't really talk about this stuff in Canada, except at the provincial level. So that's, if, if I, you'll indulge, indulge me for a few more minutes. The distinction isn't just between like these dinosaur media outlets that don't want to recognize sexual biology and you know twitter and substack which is you get more realistic coverage it's also breaks down to federal politicians versus provincial politicians because we have this really weird situation here where at the fe federal level we have justin trudeau who by the way i voted for maybe at least once maybe twice but has just turned into this complete joke right like he's just um He's like a, a sloganeering Ken doll out of like Smith College or something, just um, uttering these inane uh, progressive slogans about gender weighing. And it, while he's in office, there will just absolutely never be any progress on this file because he's just gone in so deep on the gender weighing that it would, like he can't extract himself, um, it's impossible. Uh, fortunately, it looks like he's going to get voted out of, out of office next year and a conservative politician will take his place. But what, what's been interesting is because there's such a huge vacuum of leadership at the federal level in Canada, you've had several provinces that have taken the lead. And in Canada, education, like most things, is a provincial jurisdiction. And so New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, have all enacted policies that, to some extent, uh, require parental notification before you start using um, cross-gender names or other identifiers for kids, which should, should be like completely common sense. But the same media outlets that I was dragging on before, CBC and stuff, have, I mean, they did a full court press trying to pretend a, trying to pretend that this was unpopular, which is not. Like polls show that, surprise, surprise, 80% of parents want to be notified if like some kid starts wearing chest miters. What a shocker. Uh, but also, um, the politicians in question, there was like a pretense that they were going to suffer backlash from it. But the backlash was all essentially an invention of the media. And as the weeks rolled on, there was no real political, substantial mainstream political backlash. And so... All of these provinces, sorry, Alberta, Manitoba, actually Alberta, Man Manitoba, certainly Saskatchewan, Alberta, New Brunswick, and I think maybe Manitoba, have all not enacted policies that are common sense. Parents have to be notified before you start referring to, you know, Sam or Sally. Uh, parents like it. The media doesn't like it. Um, but it's just interesting that the provincial politicians were maybe closer to the ground on this issue and actually have jurisdiction over this issue, completely common sense, at least in those provinces, and other provinces are going in the same direction, whereas the federal level, it's still like 2019 la-la land, um, completely artificial reality, and it's, it's ironic because Justin Trudeau came into power as a big feminist, and now he's presiding over, you know, one thing he does have jurisdiction over is federal prisons where women, especially indigenous women who are massively overrepresented in Canadian prisons, um, now have to share cells with dudes because, you know, Justin Trudeau is an intersectional feminist, which means penises have rights. Right. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of embarrasses me because I, I support it. Like maybe people on this call don't know this. I ghost, I ghost wrote his memoirs um, in 2000. Oh, he published. Yeah. I mean, this is, well-known 
at least in some circles in Canada. But in 2014, he published his memoirs. There's a book called Common Ground. It's behind me in the Zoom. Uh, and um, it was actually, I, I was pleased with it. I thought it was good. I mean, I wrote it, so I thought it was a good book. Um, and I liked him. I thought it was good. I, I voted for him. I uh, thought he was a nice guy, uh, smart. He's not as stupid as many people think. Uh, and then as the years passed, he started to go Looney Tunes on a bunch of issues, including this one. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's it's one of the main ones. And so it's 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 embarrassing for Canada, and it's embarrassing for me because I supported him. Wow, it must be. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah. Fun. Um, could I ask um, Eliza, if you don't mind, um, what is your thoughts about, I know you've studied it quite a lot, the internal conversations. Has there been a shift? Because, you know, John has just kind of outlined that there has been a shift outside as such. It's subtle, but it's kind of also tangible that there has been a shift. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people, it's a period of transition. Have you if you noticed this? Because I know you're following in your research a lot of the in online internal discourse. Have you noticed? Well, I'm sure you've noticed all sorts, but you let me know. You tell us okay. what, what you have noticed. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed the emergence of some convenient talking points, I think. And um, and we can see those in the coverage in the United States and in Canada. Um, and even in some of the pieces, like the Radio Canada piece, I agree, like it was really, really good, especially for Canada. Um, but it was also, what it did fall victim to was maybe the most popular way to frame kind of mild critiques of gender affirming care that we're starting to see in the US mostly, where it's like, okay, maybe it was a little reckless and maybe it wasn't right in a few cases and like, maybe it was too fast, but there's, we're very, very far from having a conversation about like, was this entire area just fundamentally mistaken. And, and that's where the conversation ultimately needs to go. Um, the two other big talking points that I've noticed have been the attempt to redefine everything as gender affirming care. So to say, you know, if you take Viagra, if you work out, go to the gym, if you dye your roots, if you do all of these, you know, if you go shopping, um, I was texting with someone today and she was like, if you like really beautiful vintage scarves, um, that that's all gender affirming care <laughs> and telling little girls that it's okay to wear dresses is gender affirming care. And therefore, how could anybody oppose this? People only oppose this when we're talking about trans kids getting surgeries. And it's like, there's a difference. Um, but, but this is the attempt to kind of make this term that has become increasingly problematic in the public imagination to be meaningless and to suggest that withholding it is something that we only do when it comes to trans people. And so it's this, it's discriminatory to suddenly care when we're talking about kids going on puberty blockers and we don't know what happens. And the other thing is um, what I would really call the kind of, oh, it's, you know, it's no big deal even if you regret it, which is the way to try mm. to deal with the problem of detransition. And there have been several major pieces in the United States, including Lydia Polgreen's piece in the New York Times that was just like, everybody has regrets. I regret quitting the swim team. Um, when I was 11 or 12. I, can, can I just intercept, intercept yeah. there? The so Lydia Paul Green, I think it's allowed to say, came to the Genspec conference mm -hmm. in, De in Denver. In Denver, And we were all incredibly aware that there was a New York Times journalist in the room. And, you know, the, the, the presentations were phenomenal. So it was like, how are these impacting these incredibly erudite, astute, articulate people with brilliant presentations impacting the New York Times journal. So it was like it was like watching different people walking up to talk to her. You know what I mean? So she mm -hmm. got the best of us in many ways. And then, yeah, I'm dying for you to come in. Just I'll just throw my tuppets in worth uh, and then you come in, Mia. And then she wrote this asinine, mm -hmm. asinine, vacuous article and talked about how she regretted giving up swimming. And, you know, yeah. we all regret things. It was a real blow to my morale that somebody could watch such brilliant presentations and actually come out with that. I could see you're dying to say something, Mia, so come on. Well, no, all I wanted to say was that she tried out the swimming analogy, the quitting swimming. She tried it out at guests, at the people who attended the conference. Many people said when they went over to talk to her that she tried out the, oh, I regret qu quitting swimming 
And they all told her absolutely how utterly outrageous and insulting and ludicrous that mm -hmm. was. And still she ran with it in her piece. She obviously went in there. The piece was already written when she went in. Oh, wow. And nothing mm -hmm. that she heard changed her mind. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. and there have been even sillier manifestations since then of regrets than the swim team. Like there was a piece in Canada that came out recently that was like, some people regret gender affirming care, maybe, but like I regret wearing a sarong. And it was like, okay, these things aren't really like each other. And right again, it's like you're prep. You know, you're talking about medicalizing something. Like when you have the wrong swimsuit, it doesn't mean then you go to the doctor's office and they like pump you with medicine or something. I mean, so it just again mm -hmm. shows either true you know ignorance that they don't understand or will willful ig ignorance that they don't want want to believe or you know that this is attached to uh the doctor's office it's again my analogy if they said let's do the pain scale in school because we want to help that future person who's going to have hard to control pain so let's ask every kid every day what their pain level is zero to ten and and it's like people say, oh, that's so compassionate and we don't want them to suffer. But if you're then attaching the number to an intervention that involves medicines um, mm -hmm. and, and surgeries, it, that's obviously extremely different. And so to just say, oh, well, they tried the pill. It didn't work. Oh, what's the big deal? They overdosed. Well, it 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 was a big deal. It's like a lack of compassion for people and that's what's so shocking it's like how how can you look at the read the w path files and and you know just not be shocked at the at the lack of concern for the the complications for diagnose the raw the misdiagnosing for for not caring for people thinking people with all these mental health issues would be at all able to understand or consent or like wouldn't be getting it wrong how, that mm -hmm. they want this. So the regret thing and minimizing it with that is just to me is just so shocking and kind of part of this, this ethical fog that has gone on with this. And can yeah. I, before you come in, Eliza, can I remind people the WPATH files, you know, and you reported on it, Mia, that they showed that they knew there was regret. They knew there was devastation. They know, I should say, in the present tense, it, they are officially aware of it. They know there's regret. They know that they regret their infertility. The dog isn't cutting it anymore. And um, they are choosing to look away, which is, mm -hmm. you know, that will that will bite them. But what were you going to say, Liza? Oh, I was just going to say we've learned what comes after no debate and it's disingenuous analogies. Oh, you're so right. And all I ever thought was we'd get debate and then everybody would hear about it and it would be all fine. And it's, it's what can be, everything can be explained away, it turns out. Well, so it, yeah, it's so it's so entrenched again in the medical practice, at least in the states and the regulations. And I saw that with the opiate crisis where it was like years of reporting on overdoses and the numbers were increasing the deaths and the devastation and still. They're just looking the other way and insisting that the hospitals and doctors prescribe the opiates because they it was attached to the pain scale and reimbursement. So I think that's that's what's important for people to understand that it it's really embedded in a, a system that's really complicated that we need to keep exposing and, and changing. So sorry, Mia, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, I I always, I still think all the time about Megan McArdle's The Oedipus Trap. Oh, yeah. And how she wrote so gorgeously about Walter Freeman in his final years, driving, zigzagging across the U.S., tracking down all the patients that had had the transorbital lobotomies, um, looking for proof. He knew in his, in his mind that he had helped and that the transorbital lobotomy was a gift to humanity. It was a humane remedy. And he was just until his dying day searching for proof. 
And I feel like that's basically, even though mountains of evidence existed, the whole world had turned against it. And I think we're there now. We're actually there now. The Anyone in WPATH now, they are Walter Freeman in those final years. The evidence is right there before them. And yet still they are convinced that they're helping and they and they just can't see it. They can't see the harm that's right there in front of them. And I do think perhaps many of them will go to their grave thinking that they really were helping all of these patients and it was only the evil transphobes who brought them mm. down. And, you know, like, so will probably the parents, because to admit that you've harmed your child is beyond 10, really beyond any kind of imagination. And the children who who won't, you know, it's very hard to regret your life. You, They'll just think this is my life. You know, I can't imagine not having been transitioned at four, etc. when you look at jazz or whatever. But I, I kind of think of, you know, Helen Joyce speaking about how and John, you might speak to this, but how the economist rolled back from weapons of mass destruction and the Iraq war. And she said, I watched this. I watched this roll back and it was actually glacially slow. It was like um, effectively when they retired, when the editor changed, <laughs> there was no slapping on the forehead and saying we were wrong. They retired out and that's yeah. how they re reiterated their new way of thinking. Yeah. And I think it's unrealistic to think like <laughs> one day I'm going to turn on the CBC and it's going to be like, oh, how wrong we were, um, you know, as today's guest. Uh, Helen Joyce will explain uh, and, <laughs> and uh, Stella O'Malley and Mia Hughes like it's not going to happen like that um, it will be a bash and by the way Canada is like going in going through another different version of that mm -hmm. this is totally unrelated but I'm sure Mia knows um, there's this in, in May 2021 there was this huge scandal over so-called unmarked graves this idea that there were um, hundreds of murdered indigenous children uh, who who had just, their cadavers had just been discovered through ground penetrating radar in British Columbia. And the whole country went into a kind of like paroxysm of self-flagellation. Like we all, it was like 35 million Benedictine monks from medieval times, like parading through the streets, um, you know, Ovulating, like it, it was crazy. Like the, the country just overnight went into this period of social panic. <laughs> Guess what? It turns out like the whole story was bullshit, and um, there are no graves. And the oh, no. radar probably was picking up irrigation pipes or something like that, or tree roots. Like the whole story fell apart. And I think there were people who who expected, like, you turn on the news and they'd say, hey, remember we told you all about those murdered kids? Turns out they weren't murdered and they were kids. And, eh, what are you gonna do? But that that that's, hasn't happened. I mean, there's mm -hmm. one or two outlets that's reported. Canada's National Post did a very good, on yeah. the one-year anniversary, did a very good piece on it. Uh, I've tried, you know, done my little part in places like Quillette. But for the most part, like, there has CBC, well, hilariously, CBC did this thing where they sent this, Full media crew to an indigenous reserve that was going to unearth all these bodies from a church and the cameras were rolling and they did the excavation that was nothing there. um and i mean to cbc's credit they actually showed the piece um they reported it even though they could have buried it um so you know there's been little bits and pieces but it's it's kind it, it's it's it was a scandal that they got the story wrong it's a second scandal that they're too mortified by their own journalistic incompetence to admit as much. And I think the same thing is going to happen with the gender stuff. Mm -hmm. they're not, there's not going to be a big moment where they admit they they screwed up massively on this. And as a result, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids self-mutilated. They're just going to stop. They're going to pick something else. They're just going to stop reporting on it. Um, okay. Any of the reporters who and activists who've gone whole hog on this will sort of, you know, fade, you know, Reporters sort of cycle through, like a lot of them just become comms directors for local provincial cabinet ministers and activists sort of eventually, you know, get other jobs. And it's just kind of going to become this fever dream that we hey, remember, remember the early 2020s when we convinced ourselves that women have penises. 
Mm. Well, kind of like COVID. <laughs> we all with that. remember that. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good point, right? <laughs> it's gonna be like remembering a hula hoop, or um, hey, remember when when women perm their hair? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a yeah. I and see. I see. I see. They cut their boobs off. Why they cut their boobs off? That's weird. Like it's going to be yeah, that, or they're gonna try and do it. Like they're gonna try and yada 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 it uh, in Seinfeld speak. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's a, like a moment. And, and to be honest, I'd be good with that. Like, I don't, you know, if they want to preserve their dignity by pretending they're good journalists, you know, I don't care. I, I know otherwise, but. I, I, I kind of would, you know, one part of me, I, I hear you, but on another part of me, having looked at the North, I, I'm from Ireland and looked at Northern Ireland and all that, you know, for peace and reconciliation, you kind of have to have some sort of truth there has to be a, a, a kind of a, a, some sort of truth and reconciliation so that we can have peace and reconciliation. It, you know, it's it's a very big point. And I think we're going to have loads of webinars. I, I think like we've got over 764 people in our Twitter space tonight. So you're all very welcome. Wow. I thought yeah. It was six. Yeah. Um, but we should uh, we should look at the questions. Carrie, could you possibly lead with the questions and pick out yeah, some good yeah. questions? Yeah, I'm going to look. But then I also want everyone here on the panel to look and see if they see some things they want to oh, yeah. want to talk about. But there, I one thing that stuck out. Someone, of course, is giving kudos to kudos to Mia for all her hard work and just asking yes. to. Uh, yeah. maybe um, speak a little bit about like the genesis of, you know, the files and the reporting and how, how that was done. I know we've spoke, you've spoken about that before. And, and I think definitely the first webinar, just, you know, how, like, how did it come about and how does that work at, at environmental progress? How did you, what was the process for which you formulated the report and all that? So yeah, I can. I, I, I've been doing so many interviews, so I can't ever tell when I've said this or to whom I've said it. So the when I I started writing for Michael last April, but I was writing for Public. That's his Substack. Right away, we got the W Path files. Michael was given them. I don't know who the source is or sources. And I tried to turn them into a series of, we, we were working on a series of three articles and we tried many times. There were many failed attempts and it just could not, we could not make it work. Michael had the idea then to move me over to environmental progress, which is his nonprofit. And as the name suggests that the gender issue was a little bit outside of what this, this nonprofit had done before, but it's a pro-humanity, pro-environment, pro-humanity nonprofit. That's what it that's what it exists for. And so this is within the realm of what it does. And it was a brilliant idea. It was definitely the right idea. So I I set to work. It took about four or five months of solid writing and then a month or two of editing. But he gave me the chance not only to read all of the the scientific literature to support what I was writing about and go into the history, but also to compare to the past medical scandals, which is obviously my favorite thing. That's what I love to do. And yeah, it was it was it was a lot of work. I've never done anything like it. I've written written articles and Twitter threads before, so. It, but it was great. I loved it. And I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. Does that answer the question? What, I, don't... I think so. Could I just jump in? Because I see a question here that yeah. I, I, I would like to point out. Somebody said, if you look at the Wikipedia on WPATH, you can see why there are challenges to getting the WPATH files controversy into WPATH's Wikipedia. If someone could help me providing with sources to quote that I could use without starting an edit war, I would like to make sure that this controversy is covered. Could you help me to do that? I would urge that person if they if somebody else might answer this, but I would urge them to contact Genspect um, and we would certainly help with that because it's really, really important. And it's something that we we feel very strongly with and we would help you if you need it. I don't know. Do you want to add anything to that, Mia, about the. Wikipedia. I know most people give up on Wikipedia, but some people don't. 
I hadn't even considered that's a great idea whoever you are that put that in I think that's a wonderful idea I hadn't even considered putting it in there I predict it won't if you make it if it makes it in there it won't last very long but it's definitely worth a try isn't it I think so have you any other questions Carrie that you spotted well I saw of course John there's lots of kudos kudos to you in there um but one one Canadian, our friend Lori, who was with us actually last week on the on the panel, was asking just about how sort of your take on how other Canadians can kind of be most effective in aligning with the change with Alberta and the changes that are going on there in terms of uh, supporting, you know, yeah. Alberta's. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. Like, I'll be honest. My view of this isn't just as like a pundit or um, you know social media commentator or something like that. Like this has also invaded my personal space because what happens is you know I I'm very fortunate I, I live I've had good luck in life I live a privileged life so I'm kind of immersed socially in some of the same like upper middle class white land acknowledging pronoun citing settlers on stolen land demographic that i regularly made fun of on twitter like when i when i'm on twitter i'm making fun of my neighbors mm -hmm. uh, who i actually get along with in real life um because we just talk about dogs we don't talk about social media and what i find is that the biggest barrier to people embracing common sense on this isn't so much the major political issues and it's not really the seat no one watches the seat no, no one cares about the cbc it's 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 sad like i i feel guilty even making fun of the cbc although that doesn't stop me it's but it's what stops people is often their their social context because most of us know at least one or two parents of trans identified kids and these parents who thought they were doing the right thing Several years ago, said, "Okay, my kid is is a girl. My kid is a boy. They're like their teacher told them to do it. Their therapist told them to do it. Stella, you know all about how this is captured yeah. the therapeutic community. Um, Justin Trudeau was telling them to do it. Um, you know, I am Jazz was on TV. Like this was the cool thing to do. And then the years passed, and it became clear that the kid had other issues, and there were all these comorbid psychiatric stuff going on." But once you've made that promise to a kid, it's very hard to go back. You know, we were talking before about like how Justin Trudeau can't go back on all this non gender wing nonsense he's done. But think of it like this is a wrenching thing. When parents promise to a kid, I'm not going to let anybody hurt you. I'm not going to let anybody misgender you. I, you'll, you'll be a girl for the rest of your life. And I'm going to make it my business to convince the world that you're you're just as much a girl as, as people mm -hmm that everyone who was born a girl. And then you're 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 vested in it. And and often like when I'm on social media or when I'm talking to people in the neighborhood, like people will say, yeah, you know, like, oh, the science is the problem is like my niece is non-binary. And if I like, if I don't sort of call my niece they them, it's gonna be like a whole thing at the Passover Seder. And I don't want to deal with that. Like everybody knows at least one blue haired aunt who's like all in on this bullshit and they don't want to lose friendships. And, uh, I mean, to be candid, there's someone in my extended family who went all in on this and this was somebody I was friendly with and it destroyed our relationship. Um, and this was not somebody who had gender dysphoria, but was like so immersed in the allyship cult that it was like, in a way it was worse because, you know, I feel I feel bad for people with gender dysphoria. I, I want to try and help palliate their um, their distress, but if you don't have gender dysphoria and you're still being super annoying, that <laughs> to me is like okay, well you have no excuse. You're just a dick. Um, but that to me, it's the, it's that social dynamic which is the biggest impediment to common sense, um, and that itself, like that's just going to have to play out in a natural organic way like these these adolescents are going to become young adults and eventually like they're going to have families and they're going to 
stop being depressed and they're like they're going to find things in life and like the covid pandemic you know that was obviously a big thing where people, for three years people were just staring at their screens watching stupid tinder videos or not uh, tumblr videos um and that eventually like if that's for 90 percent of them their gender distress is going to resolve um mm -hmm. and and then you know again it's not going to happen all at once but People don't want to lose relationships with people who have gone in on this cult. And, and I, I, not, I understand that because no parent wants to be seen as breaking a promise they made to a kid. And if that parent is your friend, you want to help them maintain that fiction that maybe in a well-intentioned way they, they embraced several years ago. And now that they've done it, they don't see a way to get out of it. So I have, you know, I have some sympathy and patience with those people. It's not going to last forever. Um, but it's not. It's also not going to end in a decisive way because people are going to need time to extract themselves from these promises they made to children. Uh, uh, I, because biology is real. I'd like to add something. I I don't. Well, I I think yeah, the gender wang and the gender woo will go. But I actually think gender dysphoria as a manifestation of distress. I think we're stuck with that. I think it's going to be mm -hmm. like anorexia, bulimia, self harm. It's going to be one of those manifestations that some small number of, well, teenagers, come on, Carrie, you're dead, trying to get in on this. <laughs> finish the point that, a small, that it's just, yeah. it's gone in to the psyche of teenagers as a way to hate their bodies. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a golden thread between anorexia, bulimia and, and, and self-harm and gender dysphoria of teenage girls and it feels so ingrained as a well, go on, Carrie. I'm done. Or Mia. I'm oh done. no, no, no. I I agree with you. I mean, I I just also think again, it's so ingrained in the apparatus of that of the healthcare system, and of course, um, you know, psychological distress. You know, since like the first pills were created in but the nineteen fifties, gender dysphoria, or it'll be called whatever the hell. Yeah, I mean, they they've, they've already. Sex. Yeah, they've already changed the name and the DSM and the ICD. Yeah. And it, it's more that it's a, it's a feel a bad feeling attached to a pharmaceutical or a procedure, and that's just a pattern that's been been going on. But I know what yeah. John's saying because even I mentioned like Abigail Schreier's book to just some friends and talking about over prescribing, and people just jumped down my throat. Just the wow. concept, like that maybe kids are on too many pills. It's is very just in my social circles is is people freak out. Obviously, at the hospital, I tell people all the time they're on too many pills, including their kids. But in the mm -hmm. what John's saying is so is so true. Um, but I, I wanted to ask Eliza something okay. just on this, like generationally, because I, I might be the most senior here. But generationally, do you think also just this the sort of social justice mentality, just to use that rubric, like. How do you how do you see I guess that you know playing playing out you know generate generationally like for your generation you just feel like that is just so ingrained that that's just going to be a, a long lasting thing because there's always disparities there's always people there's always inequalities and I know for the younger generation it's just so at top of mind with everything mm -hmm. which is not at all how, you know, I, I grew up. Um, so I'm just curious about, about that, ge like generationally, what you think. Yeah. Um, I mean, bear in mind that I'm a good 15 to 20 years older than like the ROGD kids right now. Um, so I'm not going to talk about my own generation so much. Uh, yeah. here, but I think what I would say is, you know, if we're talking about a kind of a way of being an unhappy person that has come into vogue lately and whether that's going to go away or how that's going to change. It is much easier to see kind of gender performance becoming uncool as, you know, more and more parents oh, yeah. and more and more teachers get into it and just make it excruciating. Um, it's much easier to see that happening than it is to see this kind of moving out of the the symptom pool or, you know, the the kind of the idioms of distress that young people have to unconsciously choose between when they have something that they need to communicate about the way that they feel. And, you know, this is a template that 
is currently taken very seriously. And it's also, it's obviously appeals to us on a very deep level in its separation of, you know, who we are and, and our bodies. And, and I think, you know, being online encourages that kind of disembodiment, but it's also just a pretty consistent feature of how do we as human beings deal with our limitations. And, and that part of that is, is, you know, it takes all of these different manifestations, but it's thinking of the body as a vessel or a meat suit or whatever it is. Oh my God. That's alienated from ourselves. And the, that's not going anywhere. Mm, I agree. I agree. Like, probably I with video games, right? Like, oh. as mm -hmm. a token dude on this panel and somebody who has a very <laughs> strong, strong, lifelong um, relationship with video games, uh, I think that a lot of people underestimate the influence of video game culture, especially beginning in the early 2000s when you had like first person, highly realistic first person video games that started to um, really introduce customizable uh, yep. features. Like one story I tell is that, so this, this is a game that does not fall into that category, but I guess about 20 years ago, Nintendo came out with its uh, Wii system, its WII, oh, yeah. and um, the protagonist character in that was called the Me, the M-I-I, so it's like Wii, Me, so I get it. Um, and I, I got all these games for my kids, which of course I played, like Mario Kart and, and stuff, and I have three girls, and I noticed, like, there were whole evenings that they didn't play the games, they just spent the entire time customizing their Me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Like different hair, <laughs> different clothing. That's and, so girlish. Uh, oh um, my gosh! And I have three yeah, boys, and they're the opposite, but, right? They're that's so sure. interesting. Yeah, I mean, they just wanted like, well, I don't care what the me looks like. Let's let's shoot each other. Um, <laughs> and I just they, they we did play like we played Mario Kart. It's not they didn't. After I hectored them a bit, they finally settled on their me, and we started playing. But um, if you grow up immersed in that kind of highly addictive video game mm -hmm. entertainment um you start to take for granted the idea that um your true like what is called an avatar so it's obviously like an avatar mm -hmm. online or rpg type thing but you start to kind of internalize the idea that hey wait maybe like i'm an avatar and i can customize it myself you are right Mm -hmm. right. get, get in touch with like who I really am um and you see this a lot and I'll, like I've, I've had some of my writers write about this a lot of the same people who were into video game culture uh, by the way a shocking number of people I've spoken to have become radicalized on gender through like the chat sessions in video games um mm -hmm. like highly immersive video games but often these are the same people who get into um highly stylized Japanese androgynous anime subcultures, which feature like these very sort of epicene Peter Pan type girlish boy girls who like flit mm. around these giant mushroom kingdoms and stuff. Um, like there's you know spirited away at all these um, legitimately good um, animated universes, which you know are brilliant aesthetically, but also like encourage this kind of magical cosmic idea of the human condition being a customizable type of existence which of course is not right like if or i wouldn't look like this uh but if, if if especially during covid if you're playing video games 12 hours a day um it's yeah. such it's such a good point. Could I just point out, and I know there's a question for Eliza that I'd love to answer. So maybe you'll see that Carrie you can call it out for Eliza. It's the second last question, I think. And um that when my, my boy is 14, and when he was 13, maybe 12 or 13, I just walk by. I have no interest in video games. I probably should have more. But anyway, I he was only getting into them. And I saw him uh he I just looked at the screen and it was this big sexy ass woman with big arse and big boobs and I said what the hell is she like what has she got to do with your game and he goes oh that's me and I looked at him thinking no, not for long son <laughs> I did not like intuitively I thought you didn't, you didn't affirm no no you didn't no affirm his avatar <laughs> what you didn't affirm his avatar I absolutely didn't I intuitively oh, I intuitively got 
Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not good for you sexually to imagine you're that big, sexy girl. Like, Jesus Christ, and you're 13 and you're a boy and you're just starting and blah, 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 blah. genie. So, yeah, no, 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 I did not affirm it. I, did, I didn't think much of it as I didn't like it. I just intuitively, I just thought, and I I hadn't given, I, I've obviously given it quite a lot of thought, but I really saw it in real life in that moment. And I went, whoa, you look like you're keen to say something. Uh, yeah. No, no, what? I was, I mean, I just, John, I've never, I mean, so many people talk about social media and all the online stuff. And I know John, I've listened to a lot of, you know, Jonathan Haidt talking about his new book and all that, but. I've never heard anyone talk about, you know, the video games and the, I mean, what you're saying with the like, you know, dressing up your character and all that. So I think that was totally, <laughs> totally brilliant. Um, but do you, I know we have a, just a couple minutes left. Let so. me just say a piece and then let oh, Eliza ask this. That, yeah. yeah the, have you ever heard of the Proteus effect? Like it's, I think it's been studied now where, you you become you behave like your avatar like so if you've got a really sexy avatar image like a profile picture or your avatar you you tend to act more flirtatious oh when you're God. in in that on that account oh, yeah. or if you've got a really big sort of masculine what's character you here? will what's the proteus part? effect yeah. Okay. Um, I think I hope I'm getting that right. I think that's what it is. It's a it's really a thing. So yeah, you mm -hmm. Stella, I think you were right when you saw that. Oh my to, uh, god! To put a stop to that. No way. You know, it's just like <laughs> confusing. Just when you're starting, no god, no. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, that's why my whole personality is like depressed German expressionist <laughs> <laughs> from my avatar. <laughs> and, and and yet for me, it's another reason not to actually be online. I feel yeah. like it's. Yeah, Not that's sure. the best, like, obviously the best approach. Right, it's like, whoa. I had to I, stop it, myself from starting there. <laughs> like, like, oh my gosh. This last question um, for, I think it's for Eliza and we'll better close up, but we're going to run more of these. They've been such a success. I can see there's yeah. 945 on this. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's, no, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do more because okay. there's so much to unpack, but um. Eliza, it looks like the second to last question, if you scroll down through the Q&A, it's, um, uh, it, it's a little lengthy, but asking to what degree you think there's a Venn diagram mm -hmm. overlap, you know, with the professionals and activists. Um, and, uh, you know, I see, you can see their autonomy was the paramount consideration and how widespread do you think this attitude is and how well intentioned could we say professional? I mean, you kind of, you, you answer a little bit with, you know, what you were saying about the medical professionals at the beginning. Um, but I don't know if you want to expound on that. Was that the one Stella you were, you, yeah, you wanted to hear? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that this whole area of medicine has suffered from being framed on the grounds of autonomy rather than medical ethics, and that that certainly pervades the field of gender medicine. And, and the way that I have heard gender clinicians generally talk about the work that they do, um, which is that, you know, they really do see themselves as, in effect, like service providers, and they are in service of their, you know, their clients, or their customers, um, self-diagnosis and then their embodiment goals. And I think that this process of socialization that I write about in my piece for Unheard, um, and and maybe we can link that later, oh, yeah. is that to be socialized into being a good gender clinician is a process of overcoming the reservations and hangups that you felt the first time that you encountered gender medicine. And that these are the stories that are, you know, you can see glimpses of them in the files, but you can especially hear them at the conferences where Clinicians will stand up and say, you know, the first time that a patient wanted me to do this, I was really uncomfortable. Or the first time I heard that we were like blocking puberty, I was like, that's crazy. And then they got over it. And and so I think there wow. is you know, this two sided process where you are handing everything off to the patient in terms of like you are following the patient's lead. And that that requires you to step out of the role that you were trained into as a medical provider, which is that you don't give patients the lead. Patients don't diagnose themselves. They don't determine their own treatment. They don't say what, you know, a successful outcome is like you are supposed to hang on to your medical responsibility. But you can just see when you read stories from the people who left, you know, the Tavistock Gender Clinic, when they expressed concerns, those were treated as personal failings. And they said things like, you know, the more anxious and worried that you were, the more it was framed that you were just someone who just couldn't handle this work and that you're someone where, you know, in effect, your hangups, which means 
your doubts, your reservations, your questions about what you're being asked to do, you're being told that your hangups are hurting your patients. I mean, that, but that that's just classic manipulation. If anyone told me anything in the hospital I was doing that I thought needed to be done, but might not be popular, but I knew it was an ethical thing and they approached it out, you say that, no, you're the one with the problem. And yes. But it's such a good example. Your work is, is amazing because that's a hallmark of all the medical scandals, you know, in, through the 20th century, the big ones that we know about, right? Like mm -hmm. Tuskegee, opioid, other things before Nazi experiments. It's like people get past, they go, they break through the ethical barrier and, and, wow. and, and it's, you have to have that for it to scale up. So, so I just, but I, your work is so great. Yeah, go ahead, John. Um, sorry, because I, I, I just thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, because, um, so I've often compared this to, to, to cults, uh, but, but what's interesting is, uh, if, if any of you get a chance, there's a very good, uh, documentary series on Netflix about the Nixium cult, uh, which was led by this guy in, in Albany of all places named David Rainier, um, who's now in jail. Um, and, and it talks about all the rituals, um, and, and a lot of the rituals, uh, it's, it's presented in this way. It's like, uh, oh, I can see that you're still experiencing hangups based on your like your mm -hmm. board feelings about like not being a sex slave or you know not being branded or you know like that's something we're gonna have to probe in your next psychotherapy session. And then they would gaslight you. But what's interesting about it is like it it shows why there's a lot of people who see this as very exciting because all um, highly progressive movements. Um, there's a conceit that it's like smashing bourgeois norms. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of those sort of like queer theory stuff is about this is like, you know, if you are feeling like what you're doing is unethical, it's because you're like this bourgeois fuddy-duddy and like mm -hmm. destroying these ideas you have is a feature. It's not a bug. And you're a so dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. So you can see how, like, to the to to some some sort of like upper middle class person who's just dying to find some way of being transgressive, because their entire life, you know, they went to law school and they have a big house and you know, a couple of kids and a dog and they're straight, but they want to be transgressive and, and be queer. It's mm -hmm. like it appeals to them the idea of smashing these bourgeois norms of like, oh, you know, this flesh suit is not who I am. I'm like this, you know, mm -hmm. you know pie spirited uh, hexagonal lesbian or something like that. And then on the other hand, the, the appeal to autonomy has an appeal to conservatives because autonomy, liberty, like, the, like there's a lot of conservatives um, who you can see like they kind of like the idea of like futurism, like a lot of futurism is about body reconstruction. So there's a lot of like male sci-fi conservative nerds who, you know, they kind of fantasize about the idea of like living to 500 in a cryogenic chamber and modifying their body and having superpowers and Maybe they like read superhero comics and um, they like the idea of body modification. And um, they're also obsessed with sex because, you know, they're probably virgins. And so, like, you can, there are, there are different elements of this cult that you can see how they built a constituent. It's not just ultra progressive blue hair types. I, you know, I know conservatives who are partial to this kind of thing. And the people who make money off it and promote it and stuff like that, they're clever about marketing to these different constituencies, um, which is one of the reasons it's so resilient and they keep finding new messaging techniques uh, as you know, Mia demonstrated in her, uh, the WPATH files. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're, it's, it's a multifaceted phenomenon. Um, it, it, it doesn't just always, I try and remind myself, it doesn't just always break down on progressive conservative lines. Yeah. Do you want to say a last piece, uh, Eliza, before we close up? Um, it's been, a, um, it's been an interesting evening. I just, I think that John is right about, you know, all resocialization processes involve this kind of demonization of independent judgment and that, you know, this is your, like John is suggesting, this is your, you know, <laughs> internalized transphobia. This is your, like, you know, not being able to let go of your petit bourgeois, like, background, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever cultic language is a kind of applied it's the same idea that's being put down and that is being in touch with the the questions and doubts that you ought to have about what you're doing that's definitely what we see here 
which brings us around to queer theory and the oppressor and the victim and how far they got with this idea of making people ashamed of of success and ashamed of a good life. It's, it's it's an extraordinary world where down is up and up is down. What about yourself, Mia? How are you feeling three weeks after the WPAP Files report is out? <laughs> <laughs> I feel okay. I've, I'm, my interviews are now winding down. I've done so many interviews, been talking to people constantly about them. So yeah, it's it's been fun. It's been really good. And tonight has been especially fun because Eliza is my favorite writer on this issue. And John is one of my favorite people on Twitter, my favorite Canadian probably on Twitter, because he makes me laugh more than anyone else. <laughs> so it's been Thank a you. pleasure being with both of them. I had no idea you were so funny, John. We got to oh. get you back. <laughs> oh, well, I, I try and be funny on social media. Well, like, when, no, I interviewed you for the podcast. Uh, and I think it was very serious, right? So, okay. yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm a man of, you know, different complexions. I, you know, <laughs> you contain multitudes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, how about yourself, Carrie? How are you feeling after three weeks after the WPAP? Oh, I think it's just incredible. Great. Yes, I think a page has been turned. <laughs> um, I I feel it. I like the, expo you know, uh, glad for the exposure into the nitty gritty of the some of the, you know, medical, so, quote unquote, medical decision making, which isn't actually medical decision making, but just seeing um, how that's trying to be shoehorned into the regular practice of medicine. So I'm so thankful, obviously, to to the the great writers and, and all the great people trying to get the information out and um and yeah, we have a lot of great programming coming up, Stella, that we'll let people know about, you know, and as well as the conference in Portugal that's getting more and more exciting. I don't oh know if you God. want to say a last a last well, little well, word I, about I asked, some of the exciting people. I that asked have joined. Yeah. Rowling if she wanted to come and she, there, there was a lovely message where she said, well, with such a stellar lineup. They put me in the shade. And I'm like, it's true. <laughs> We've got this amazing lineup with Lionel Shriver and um, Peter Bogosh and Michael Schellenberger, Mia, Harry. Everybody is going, Eliza. Um, so it's it's going to be amazing. And there's so many, so many speakers who are going to be so, so, so special that I, I'm just absolutely thrilled. I can't even think of half of them. Frank Fioridi, Julie Bindle. Um, um, I hope I hope you told J.K. that we'd like her to still come, though. Did you tell her yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she said sadly she got to tent. <laughs> but, uh, but we anyway, we got 1,200 in the end on our Twitter space. So thank you very much for so many people turning up. It's very nice. It's amazing how the numbers go up the longer you run a Twitter space. Yeah. Oh, no, 1,300. 1.3 thousand. <laughs> oh, well, we could say maybe we'll hit a million. We'll just no. keep talking. I, I know everyone's tired. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. We'll be back. We're going to keep on running these. And thank you so much, Eliza and John, for coming on and being our yeah. guests. It's been so good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.